Want to know how the EU works? Welcome to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcast on the election of the President of the European Commission. It's one of the most cherished EU positions, but how is it attributed? Stay with us and we'll walk you through the ins and outs of a complex and highly political process which will lead to the appointment of the next European Commission President. With the European elections behind us, you may be inclined to think that the bulk of the work for the European Parliament is done. But actually, it's only beginning. After the European elections, one of the first and most important tasks of the new Parliament is to elect a new President of the European Commission. Now, how does that go? Well, taking into account the result of the European elections, member states nominate a candidate for the post. But to be appointed, he or she also needs the support of an absolute majority of MEPs. That's half of all members plus one. As part of its continued efforts to make the EU more democratic and transparent, the European Parliament has long sought to ensure that by voting in European elections, citizens not only elect a new Parliament for Europe, but also have a say over who should head the next EU executive. That's why in the 2014 elections, it introduced the system of lead candidates or Spitzenkandidaten as they became known. Now, what was the idea? Well, the idea was that ahead of European elections, each European political party would put forward a candidate for commission president. The post would then go to the candidate of the political party capable of marshalling sufficient parliamentary support. The Parliament wanted to continue this approach in the 2019 elections, and so it called on European parties to put forward their favourites by three months before the elections through an open, transparent and democratic competition, informally making them the face of their election bid. In response to this call, the European People's Party proposed Manfred Weber, chair of the EPP group, in the Parliament as its lead candidate. The Socialists elected the Commission's first vice president, Franz Timmermans, and the Conservatives and Reformists went for the Czech MEP, Jan Zahadril. Unwilling to put everything on one horse, the Liberals nominated a team of leaders for the campaign, which included, among others, Belgian Guy Verhofstadt and Danish Commissioner Margarete Vester. And both the Greens and European left elected a pair of candidates each. Now, the mechanisms for appointing the President of the European Commission, as well as the Parliament's role in them, has not always been the same. Want to know more? Stay with us. In the beginning, commissioners were put forward and the president appointed from among them by agreement of all member states and the parliament had no say at all in the process. But over time, the parliament has acquired more powers and since 2009, it is tasked with electing the next commission president by a majority of its members. At the same time, and since 2001, the council only needs a qualified majority instead of unanimity among member states to appoint the new commission president. Technically speaking, this removes the possibility of a national veto of a candidate But in practice, member states always try to seek a consensus on such an important position. So ensuring this all happens as smoothly and transparently as possible is now a shared responsibility of both the European Parliament and the European Council. But how will this evolve in future? Well, the Spitzenkandidaten process made its debut in 2014 and has continued in 2019, but with all its pros and cons, it remains contested among experts and EU institutions alike. While some hail it as a clear move towards more democracy in Europe and a promise to get more citizens to vote in European elections, others saw in the process a sheer power grab by the European Parliament at the expense of the European Council, weakening member states' role excessively. So while the Parliament and the Commission have not hesitated to show their support, the European Council has made it clear there is no automaticity in this process, warning it could not guarantee in advance that it would propose one of the party's lead candidates. So whose arguments will prevail? Well, it's clearly too early to say. What we can say, however, is that to the disappointment of many, the turnout in the 2014 elections did not increase, but further declined slightly. But who knows if it would have declined even further without the introduction of the lead candidates. In this year's elections, however, turnout climbed by almost nine percentage points. But again, it's difficult to determine what role the lead candidates played in that increase. There are certainly a lot of other factors that influence the turnout in European elections, next to the fact that domestic issues still largely dominate European election campaigns. What's sure is that it remains a very new process, and as such, there is still room for improvement. You're listening to the European Parliamentary Research Service Podcasts.